Excuse me. So we're starting here on uh, chapter 30. And this is going to be this is going to be our last um, chapter on transformation of variables, and then the rest of uh, the lectures before exam three will be on logistic regression. So um, remember what we were doing last time. We we're saying okay. So we if we have um, a plot that's not linear, it looks like it's not linear, we want to actually, if we have any scatter plot and we're doing regression and we want to do inference on it, we have to check those four assumptions. So why do we care about those error assumptions at all? Why do we care about them? So, um, I mean, we can make a point estimate. We can make estimates of we had nonlinearity in this example here. Back, this uh, example clearly, uh, we're trying to predict animals. We have 34 animals, 10 dinosaurs, and uh, 22 uh, mammals. These land animals, 34 different species. And when we tried to predict their brains from their body weight, the first thing we did before we even logged it, we just we couldn't. We had we clearly didn't have a good linear fit. Okay, so we didn't really want to fit a linear model. Now, we, we got a pretty nice fit over here um, where we did log versus log, natural logs of both. And, um, but I said, look, there's some problems here. But we went ahead and did um, estimates anyway. We did inference. Now, we really, we did that assuming excuse me, this is what we did last time, the last page, we said, assuming these four assumptions are met. But they really weren't quite met. They went, it looked a lot better when we logged both sides, but they weren't quite met. You can see that these, um, there's a violation here of a number of different things. I mean, there's different, um, a violation of, even though it looks pretty linear here, when we look at the residual plots, here, when we're plotting um, the x variable, the log of the x variable versus its errors, you can see that at the extreme ends, we have um, these negative errors. And right in the middle, we have positive errors. So there's definitely a pattern. And there's not, um, and the errors tend to be smaller. Like you can see it here, the errors tend to be smaller in the middle and much bigger at the extreme. So it violates a number of these assumptions. Independence, because there's a pattern here. Looks like there's two groups. I mean, if you know it's a big animal, you can see from the error plot that you, these errors are correlated. If you know you're up here with a huge body size, you're going to tend to get negative errors. And if you're down here with the small body size, you'll get negative. And in the middle, you get positive. So that's correlated errors. That's not in the independent errors. And also, you can see that the, uh, it's not, it violates um, heteroscedasticity because the errors tend to be smaller in the middle and bigger here. And in the log scale, they're, you know, quite a bit bigger. So that's, that means that you're pretty, really pretty far off here at the ends. So it violates, usually when it violates one thing, it violates a bunch of things. So um, what are we going to do? What, why is that a problem? Well, um, it's a problem if you want to make inferences because you're using these. We need, uh, we need those assumptions to compute the standard errors and to perform all our significance tests. If you're just making a, you know, just estimating a, the regression line, you don't really need them. But if you want to do anything with it and make inferential statistics, you, you need those errors. So what do we do? We make a scatter plot of the residuals against either the x or the predicted var variables. If you have multiple x's, you'll do it for each x against the predicted variables, the predicted against the errors. So if you have multiple x's in your equation, you do it for each x, and then against the residuals. And um, the plot should show no pattern. If it shows a trend, you know, you check for outliers. Um, 
I mean, if, if the plot shows a trend, like you say, maybe it's an outlier, or maybe, like in this case, we should split. We should split the data into two groups, right? And that's what it looks like you need to do here. You see, there's a group here that follows a very, a stronger slope. And this group right here is kind of bringing the slope down. So we'd probably do better if we split the data into two groups. And this group turns out to be the mammals. And this group right here is the 10 dinosaurs. So there's 34 animals altogether. So this really, these mammals really would be fit much better with a steeper slope. But this dinosaur group is kind of bringing the slope down. All right, and when we look at this error plot, it's even more obvious. They don't look like they're independent at all. There's this marked cluster of animals right here. These are the dinos with big bodies and small brains, right? And then there's um, this group here, right here. It does a really good estimate for, does a better estimate for the middle of this group, like for the cat right there. That's a nice estimate. It's very close to the regression line, right? But for um, these small animals down here, like, you know, the mouse and the hamster, and for these big animals up here, these big mammals, there's just really big errors here. So um, it's just, it's, um, there's correlated errors, right? So depending on the position, depending on the x variable, if you know that they're way down here, you're going to know there's negative they're negative and negative over here. And I mean, it's just correlated errors. So this is violates independence and it violates heterohomoscedasticity because you don't have the same errors across the whole graph. And it's a lot easier to see here. Let's, let's go to the, maybe why don't we go to the um, program and look at it. Okay, so let's just go here and Here's what we did first, just to refresh your memory. Uh, we saw we had to log to make sense of this at all, so we did that, and we took the log and the log here, and this is where we're at now. And then we said, okay, let's look at the error plots. And this is what you see in your notebook. So, um, Let's see, you can see who these are. So this is the Brachiosaurus, the Diplodocus. These are all dinosaurs here. And this is the mouse, the golden hamster, the mole, these rodents. And up here are the elephants and the human. Okay, so that's what it looks like. And we see that we could do better by um, fitting probably two separate lines. So we can either do two separate ones, break it into, or we could do a multiple regression and include a variable for dinosaur. And that should give us uh, a better fit. So, um, but before we do that, let me just show you, uh, sorry about, okay, log, log, and let's look. And let's do our regression. In this case, when we do a, when we show the errors, I think it's slightly more apparent that there's a definite pattern. But in your homework, it was really hard on the solar system. The straight line looked like it did a really nice fit. And a lot of people, I was looking at your homework from last night, some people were saying, well, it was too subjective a question. I said, does it make a, is it a good fit or not? And I think what, and you said you could answer, you know, I gave you three tries. And some people said yes on this first try and no on the second. But you really had to look at the residual. It's hard to tell with certain plots. 
You can see clear violations. So you can definitely answer, if you just look at the scatter plot, you can say, no, it's not linear. That's easy to do. But it's really hard to answer yes, because like with your solar system data, the scale, the straight line did a very, very good prediction. So the errors were small. And the measurements, the error measurements were really small relative to your predictions. So they didn't show up until you just look at an error plot and change the scale. So you magnified those errors just by just looking at the error plot. And you saw, they were, you saw a clear pattern. Well, that's the, I'm talking to the few people who uh, have been emailing me saying they thought it was an unfair question. It's not unfair. That's why we look at residuals. Because we can't definitely say yes until we look. We can say definitely no when we clearly see something. But we look at residual plots to get a clearer picture of what's going on. And it's very hard to tell without doing that most of the time. So I just wanted to give you a really good example of that. That's all. So if anybody still thinks it's not a fair question, you can talk to me about that. Or it's too subjective, but you had three tries. And either the answer would be, uh, no, it's not linear because it's obvious violation. That could be one thing. I could see you saying that, but it wasn't obvious. And then the next thing is you can't tell. You can't say yes until you look at the residual plots. That's the point, unless there's a straight line equation or something. Okay? The residual plots will show more. So you always should do that, unless there's a, you know, it's obvious. All right, so that's the idea. So now where do we go from here? So now we're going to, what we can do is, um, let's go back to the notes first. Well, maybe we should just stay right here. And let's see, what if we add um, another variable now? So let's get rid of this. And let's add, uh, in the x, let's add dinosaur. And it's coded, well, you can't do both of them right here on this plot. Okay, so um, what we have to do is choose a split. All right, why don't we do that? So we'll choose a split, and we'll split on dinosaur here. All right, now we'll go to split plots, and now you have two separate uh, regression equations. One is predicting the log of the brain weight for uh, the mammals, right here, and the other one for the dinosaurs. It says, so, so the mammals are level one of dinosaur, <laughs> and dinosaurs are level two of dinosaur. So you have these two separate equations, and um, look at how much better. Look at the R here. It's gone way up for uh, the mammals. You get a much better fit. So we can combine these two, and let's combine them onto one, just to see what it looks like. We'll combine them here. Now, looking at this, you might think that you would want to include an interaction term, wouldn't you? But let's see what happens if we don't. Let's just force them to both have the same slopes and see what happens. So what's the difference? I'm looking at um, this R for, uh, let me just look at this. If you force them to have the same slope, how does it change these correlations here? Um, see how it doesn't change it much? Why? It's because this, it's not, you know, if you want to add an interaction term, every time you add another term, an interaction term is kind of complicated. That's going to complicate your model and be hard to interpret. Do you want to do that or not? So it looks like, yeah, if you just look at the visual here, it looks like it's, a, it, it, it's much better to actually you think, because the slopes are so different, that we should add an interaction term. But, you know, this is, do you see how the x's, these dinosaurs are so close together? It's almost, think of it as almost one giant point. Almost any line through here is going to give about the same correlation. It's just like they're so close together here. So even though I fit them, watch this R. It's 0 0.4017. And so if I, um, you'd think, okay, now it's going to go, if I force it to have the same slope, you'd think that's going to really dramatically decrease, and it hardly changes at all. So it's not, it's not worth doing. And um, so we might as well, I mean, it's not worth adding, keeping, 
it's not worth adding an interaction term if we do a multiple regression because it's not going to help very much. This is just like, compared to all this, this, this is just like one giant point, so it's not worth doing. So what we can do is we can show equal slopes like this, and then we can make a multiple regression uh, equation without an interaction term that gives us the same thing. So, um, and let's look at the errors now. Show errors. And see how they're much better? These errors are, don't show a clear pattern. There's pretty good, uh, they're pretty good, these errors. Uh, there's more points in the middle, so there's more spread. But there's, you know, there's, it's not like, a, it doesn't seem to violate anything here. It's much, much better. It looks like a random scatter. What, look, as you go up in your x variable, you can't predict whether they're going to be positive or negative. They're both all the way across the board. This is a much better error plot. It doesn't violate that independence. And it doesn't violate the hetero, the homoscedasticity because there's about an equal spread all the way across. Look, there's big errors here, and there's some small errors here. It's just, it's a, it's a nice error plot, as opposed to the other one where we didn't have the, um, the, the previous one that we are looking at in our notebook. Does that make sense to people? Okay, let's go back to the notebook then. And um, fill that in. All right, so, um, so let's see. So that's pretty much what we talked about here. Uh, since it seems like we have two separate groups, we do a better fit if we include the group membership as an independent variable. Now what does the fit look like? We just looked at it and I have it in your notebook. That's this. So here we included that uh, variable. And uh, if we include this in a multiple regression, it's equivalent to, you know, this is two separate regressions. It's a, it will be the same thing as two simple regressions. Um, and have we succeeded in improving the fit? Yes. Are the errors cleaned up? Yes. They are. Okay, so now we can do some, uh, we should look at the output from the multiple regression here. Why don't we, uh, we can do that, but maybe first what we should do is just make, yeah. Let's look at this output, but let's do it on the computer so you can get a feel for what we're doing. So let's go back to this. And, um, and now what are we going to do? All right, so let's do it as a multiple regression. So we're going to go to regression here and do, some, do an F test. And so we'll choose our Y variable. And it's, our Y variable is the brain weight. Uh, let's say we didn't log it. Let's say we just did the brain weight and body weight. Then we get this terrible p-value, right, like we got before. We can do either an f or a chi-square. We get, we get uh, really, uh, it's awful. So we, now we decided to log both of them. I'm just doing the same thing we did before. So we do a log, and then we have to do a log down here. Transform the body weight to a log. All right, so this should be the same thing that we have, right? Is that the same thing on the first page? We have this uh, equation. Just check on your page 163. Yeah, it says uh, two point, the intercept is 2.982 plus 0 0.3190. And we have this um, standard deviation of the errors here, 1.565. All right, and that's what we've got. We could do it as an F, and what would change? Okay, so now we have standard deviation errors plus 32 degrees of freedom. Okay, 34 animals. Now, um, we want to see if we get a better fit if we now include dinosaur. So we should get a better fit, right, if we include dinosaur. 
don't you think? Maybe I should ask some eye clicker questions at this point so you can, so you can anticipate what we're going to get. So why don't we do that? And, um, like, Like, this is what we have now. We have an R squared of 0 0.4183. We have these standard deviation of the errors. Here's our p value. Here's our f stat. OK, so let's just, um, OK, so let's look at some eye clicker questions. And um, first off, let's. OK, so first off, what we're going to do is just um, let's compare those two standard deviations of the errors we just looked at, right? The standard deviation of the uh, errors, uh, how does the SD plus compare to it? So SD plus, which we just saw, is bigger than the one we have on our first page, 1.565 by a factor of what? How do you convert between these two? Do you remember? This one's bigger by the square root of what over what? Forgot a parenthesis there, sorry. Just um, so that's your first question. I'm going to stop it now, OK? Um, stop it uh, right now and see what you said. And it's the square root of 34 over 32, so it's B. Most people got that. That's good. And um, let's, whoops. And that's because we have uh, 34 animals, and the parameters are 2. Here it's just, we just have the body weight, log body weight, and the intercept. So it's the square root of N over N minus P. So it's that one. Now let's look at the next question here, which was the one we were just talking about. So we'll start that. And let's pull this over here. And it says, we expect dinos will improve the fit of the model. So what do we expect? What do you think is going to happen? Do you think if it's R squared will increase, the standard deviation plus the errors will decrease, F will increase, P will decrease, all of the above? What? So just choose one of those choices, and then we'll look at it. That's where we left. Just that's what we were just doing. Like, is this R squared going to get better? Right? Is this SD plus error going to go down? Is the F stat going to go up? If we improve our model. Okay, and so let's stop it now. Just choose. Okay, you're all done. So we'll choose this, and I hope you got the right answer here. Yes, you did. All of the above. So let's look at that. And that's the answer, and let's see if it does. So yes, each one of those things happened. R squared certainly went up dramatically. The standard deviation of the errors went down from 1.6 to 0 0.7. That's a really significant decrease. Um, F uh, increased, and the P, you, it doesn't show up here, because we had a very good fit to, you know, it, it doesn't show up here, unfortunately, but the P would have decreased if we took it out to more significant digits. It, it just doesn't show up here. If we change the program, I think it only goes to four significant digits or something. OK, so that's the answer. So let's go back to, let's get rid of this. Any questions on that? Any questions on that? So now we can go, um, let's get rid of this, and we can look at it here. So let's do it. So this is what we have which is without the dinosaurs. So let's put the dinosaurs in. And now you can see just what you saw, you anticipated. And you saw that we have a much better fit. And so can we, um, 
Let's see if we can do anything more with this. Let's look at the error plots. Can we show the error plots? Yeah. So now we have, this is our error plot here. And um, what it's showing instead of the separate x's, we have two x's now. So it's showing the predictions versus the errors. The predictions, this is another way to do these residual plots. And here's our predictions on the x-axis. With multiple x's, this is a sort of standard way to do it. And we can see the African elephant they estimated very well. All these, the donkey, a lot of them, you know, have nice estimates. The human is just an al is just, humans are very different than other animals in this regard. So that's why we're, even when you, even when you make a really nice fit, we're going to have the biggest, uh, you know, brain to body ratio. And the rest of it looks pretty good. Um, so that's, that's the idea. And the errors are fairly normally distributed. Okay? So um, I just think it's uh, useful in s to just go through examples to learn how to, you know, look at these residual plots. So now, just to make sure you understand how to interpret this, let's go back to what we did before. So you see a printout. What's the multiple regression equation? And show us how it's the same as the two simple regression equations. All right, so we might as well do that. So here's our printout. And here, the multiple regression equation, it's right here, we have an interest. So we'll say the predicted log, even though it says, looks like it's log base 10, it's log base E. So it's a natural log, predicted natural log of brain weight. I'm just looking right here. Is equal to an intercept 2.257 plus 0 0.7263 times the log of what? The body weight. And then minus, right, because minus 4.833 times the 0, 1 dinosaur variable. So this right here is zero, one, and it's, if you're a mammal, it's zero, not dinosaur, is zero, not dino, mammal, is equal to zero, and if you're a dino, it's equal to one. All right, and that's what we have here. And then, um, now the question is, okay, let's, when we plug in a zero, do we, for, wait for mammals, when we plug in a zero here, do we actually get the simple equation? So you put a zero, you're going to get that. Is that the same as the simple equation up here? And it is. So it checks, right? You can write that down if you want. So for mammals... we get the log, the predicted log of the brain weight is equal to 2.257 plus 0 0.7263 times the log of the body weight minus 0, right? So that checks with, I'm just looking up here, it checks with that, okay? It's the same thing. So now let's just make sure we get the same thing for dinos. So for dinos, we're going to get the predicted log of their brains. Brain weight, it's going to be the same here, right, this whole thing. But instead of having a minus 0, we have a minus 4.833. So we can add those two together. And we get 2.257 minus that. So we get negative 2.577 plus the same slope times the log of the body weight. And that checks too. All right, so that's good. That checks with this, this right up here. So that's nice. And... um. Before I forget, uh, in case maybe we should uh, 
the eye clicker question I asked before was comparing, so let's just turn back the page so you can remember this. Just write it down here. What were we doing here? We were comparing, this is our standard deviation of the errors, and the question was, how does, what's the standard deviation plus of the errors? So the standard deviation plus, if we wanted to adjust that, it's going to be what? It's going to be, we'll take, it's the standard deviation of the errors, that, and we're going to make it a little bit bigger, and we make it a little bit bigger because instead of dividing, remember, instead of dividing by n like you do if you don't make any adjustment, instead of dividing by n and then taking the square root, so we're going to get rid of that, square root of n, and instead we're going to divide by n minus the number of parameters, n minus p. That's what we're doing. And we have n was equal to 34 animals, and p was equal to two parameters. So that's how we got that factor of the square root of 34 over 32. Okay, that was just what we've done before. Any questions so far? All right, so now, um, so we've, okay, so we've decided that this is a nice fit, and we looked at the error plots, and this is what I just showed you in the program. We looked at these, they're on page 165 now, and um, it looks nice. It looks really nice. This looks random. This looks okay. It's not exactly normal, but it's pretty good. And so we can go ahead and then we can perform significance tests on the model, build confidence intervals, and so forth. So that's the idea. So we might as well do that, okay? And interpret what they mean. So let's do that. So basically, we already did it. Uh, so we can do the same thing. We already d we jumped the gun because I just wanted to show you the confidence intervals right away so you could get started on that, assuming they were true. It's going to be exactly the same thing. You do those two-step confidence intervals where you have to do it first on the log, the transform variable, and then get the endpoints of the confidence interval and then transform those back to the original variables. So, all right, let's, so let's just make sure before we move on, well, I want you to interpret these coefficients in a log model is because our next section, uh, starting Thursday, is all about logistic regression. And so that's, we're just, it's useful now to just understand what these coefficients in log models do first. Okay? All right. So now, um, so let's look at our output of our model again. What did we get? We got from the previous page this, right? I don't know why I wrote it twice here. This is just what we got from our previous page. And now, this exact same thing. And now we wanted to, what, how do you interpret these coefficients and how do you, first of all, translate them? Oh, I see why I wrote this. Okay, so you just, we want to translate this into that. And since some people can't immediately see that, um, we should probably maybe do it out. All right? So, so I know math majors will think this is silly, but all right. So 2.257, this is we're in logs, plus 0 0.7263 times, I mean, silly just because they do this all the time, so it's arithmetic times the log of the body weight, but some people might be rusty on this, so they might not see how to immediately get from there to there. So, and then you have plus negative 4.833 times the dyno variable. All right, so we want to go, we want to do that. So what are we going to do? So um, how do we, we want to anti-log both sides. We basically want to take E to, the, you know, do that right? And simplify. That's all we're doing to get here, okay? So I could do it step by step if you want. So we say e to the, well, I can write it down here, e to the 2.257 times, right? That's going to be times, and um, well, e to the, um, we're raising, we're exponentiating this, 
and let's just rearrange it. So we'll put log body weight here times 0 0.7263. And you can see that this part right here, e raised to the log body weight, is just body weight. So that's how you just get that, right? That is body weight, so that we got that. And then we have, there it's plus, we're exponentiating, so it's times e to the minus 4.833 times dyno. And then we just go from here to here by definition. All right, so we've got that. And now, um, interpret these coefficients. Well, you see that it's, why is it negative here? It's negative um, because dinosaurs are coded, dinosaurs have smaller brains, and dinosaurs are coded as one. So when we put a, we, when we put a zero in, um, so it's just going to show that dinosaurs have smaller brains, right? All right. Um, so why don't we... Why don't we do that? So why don't we see what happens when we, so what does it mean for mammals and what does it mean for dinosaurs? All right, so let's look at that. So for mammals, what does this simplify to? All right, so for mammals, we have that the brain weight is equal to e to the two point, this is about nine and a half, so it's just this constant, e to the 2.257 times the body weight raised to the 0 0.7263 and times, what are we going to put in for dinosaur for Mammals, that's a zero, so it's e to the zero, which is just one. Right? When you put a zero in for dinosaurs, e to the zero is one. So that's what we get for mammals. And for dinosaurs, what do we get? For dinosaurs, we're going to get brain weight equals to, it's going to be the same thing here, about nine and a half times whatever body weight we have. You know, the bigger the body, the bigger the brain, by the, right? But now, instead of, we're going to put a 1 in here for dinosaur. So you get times e to the negative 4.833. 3, is it, or is it just 2, 3, yeah, sorry, times 1. That's about, this, this is basically the same, this is, this uh, is, it's negative, of course, so it's smaller than 1, it's going to be 0 0.008, approximately, that's what that is. So basically, that's the same as dividing by 125. So, if you figure out a mammal's weight this way, then just divide it by 125, and that's our best estimate for the dinosaur's weight. So that's the idea. And so the brain weight of a dinosaur is about um, that factor right there, e to the negative 4.833, which is 1 over 1, 0 0.08, which is equal to 1 over 125. All right. Um, so that's... Where does that factor appear in the regression equation? What are we doing here? So what we're doing is when you have this in the regression equation, what re regression equation? Well, for the log is this factor right here. It's the slope for dinosaurs. We're, we're taking um, what was that factor of e to the whatever you see basically in the log equation, this slope. If you, t if you exponentiate it, it's going to be e to that slope will be the factor that, um, it's a multiplicative factor, the difference between, um, in this case, between going from 0 to 1, in, uh, which means going from a mammal to a dinosaur. So, where does that factor appear? Okay, why don't we just highlight it? 
Well, obviously it appears here, but it's here. Maybe you're going to see this come up a lot. And so basically the factor appears um, e to the, this factor of e to the minus 4.833 is really e to the slope of, or the coefficient in front of the variable, the slope of, of dinosaurs for dinosaurs in the log equation. And whenever I say log, it's natural log. But it would be the same base anything. You'd have that same relationship. Um, we talked about that last time. Only the intercept would change. You'd still have that same multiplicative factor no matter what base you're in. So you could, that's why people would just log, any log. Just natural log is nicer to work with. All right, so now the regression equation predicts a 90-kilogram mammal to have a brain weight of what? And uh, a 90-kilogram dinosaur to have a brain weight is uh, 0.008 smaller than that. So let's just do, do it though. So for a mammal, we have the equation. Uh, I'll just plug in right here. 90 in there. And then plug 90 in there. And you can see the difference is just going to be a factor of 0 0.008. So we can get it if you want. So we'll say the brain weight, the predicted brain weight for a mammal is going to be e to the 2.257, right, times its body weight, which is 90, raised to the 0 0.7263 power. And when I did that, I got 251. And so this is just going to be 251 divided by 125, which is about 2. We can do it. I mean, it's just for the dinosaur. It's the brain weight is going to be equal to this times e to the negative 4.833, which is approximately equal to 2. All right, so comparing them, we expect a multiplicative change of e to that coefficient in front of the dinosaurs. So... So the idea is that when you have a log equation, a log-log equation, like we're predicting, um, when you have this equation, then it translates, these slopes translate into um, these multiplicative changes. All right. Of E raised to that power, raised to the slope. You'll see this a lot more in logistic regression. So now let's move ahead and... So now we're going to uh, look at this, uh, another transformation, which is a square root transformation. We're going to try to correct this, these fan-shaped graphs, where you have linearity, but you just don't have equal variance across all the x's. And that's a problem, because when you make these, you use the same standard error, the same, we're computing these standard errors and saying they're, we're assuming they're the same across all the x's, and they're not. And if we just applied those, that, constant standard error, we're going to be, we have much worse estimate up here, much bigger error bars than we do down here. And so this is an example of our data for, it often happens that you'll get bigger error bars for bigger values up here. So for, this is our uh, data for party, predicting how much you drink from how much you party. Okay, and um, the common way to correct this is by taking square roots. So the scatter plot below detects, depicts the responses of 1,014 college students. It was our real survey data from, uh, I think it was, you have a whole, your homework problem is on the same data set. Um, and it says where it's from, so you can look at it. All right, I think it's fall 2012 in STAT 100. All right, how many hours do you party per week on the average, and how many alcoholic drinks do you consume? And notice the error, incre error increases. See, look at this. It has this like fan-shaped. Gets bigger and bigger. The errors are small around here, which, and bigger as we go on. 
And here's the regression equation, and there's the correlation. So the linearity looks fairly good. Um, why is this a problem? We just said it's because um, uh, because we can't use the same error bars, you know, our standard errors and confidence intervals. We can't use the same error bars for um, across all the x's. We have a lot more uncertainty when it comes to here, and a lot less there. OK, the most common way to correct this is by taking square roots. So let's do that. All right. And so let's do it. So here's the scatter plot of square root of drinks times square root of party hours, like that. And now you see the residual plot's better. It's better, it's not perfect, but it's better. And now we get this equation in square roots. So it's predicting your square root of your drinks times the square root of your party hours, and we get a higher r. See, your r is higher. Before it was 0.7 in the previous page, right? 0.77, it's, it's higher. Now how did r change after taking square roots? r went up. The regression equation is that now. The square root of drinks, the predicted square root of drinks, equals, it's kind of funny to predict, it's very anti-intuitive, times the square root of party hours. All right? So how many drinks per week does the regression equation predict for someone? Because nobody wants, I mean, you can do it in terms of square root, but people... Nobody's interested in the square root of your drinks. You don't order a square root of a drink when you go to a club. You're not like saying, hey, go to a doctor. How much do you drink per week in square roots? It doesn't even really make sense. So you want to do it in terms of drinks. So we take this, the square root of drinks, and get an estimate here, right? So we plug in. So first we'd say the square root. We'd make a prediction for the square root, because that's what this model's based on, and that's what these standard errors are based on. It's the same like when we did log log, and then we'll transform it back. So we have negative 0 0.1898 plus 1.083 times the square root of 25. And when I did that, I got 5.2. So now we translate it into drinks. So drinks, squaring both sides, is 5. 0.2 squared, which is 27 drinks. And that gives us a better estimate. Particularly, uh, not some, this is sort of in the middle of the data set, will give us a much better estimate towards the ends. All right, so that's good. And now what do we want to do? We want to construct a 95% confidence interval. And we'll do it the same way as on page um, 162 that we did, right? And here we go back to one page 162. And we're just going to do it in these two steps. You, for transform variables, you always follow. You find the M, find the, this is on 162, you find the endpoint to the confidence interval for the transform variable because that's what the standard deviation of the errors, your errors are calculated in. Right now, they're calculated in, here they're in terms of log, and here they're in terms of this. It's in terms of square root. So you do that, you find that, and then step two is you transform it back to the original variables. Here we anti-logged it, and here we're going to square it just by transferring the square root back to the square. So let's do that. So it's like, so C uh, page, what, 162. We're doing exactly the same thing. And our first step, and you always do this if you have transform variables. You do it, you first calculate it. You have to because uh, this standard deviation of the errors is calculated. It's the square root of the drinks plus or minus this amount, not the drinks. Okay, so step one, so for like a 95% confidence interval, what would we do? We'd have to do it first for the square root of the drinks. And we can do that. 
we'd get what? This estimate. You always get your point estimate, 5.2 in this case. And then you're going to get plus or minus. Uh, since it's 95%, we're going to put 1.96 here, but I just want to do it in our head, so we'll say 2, round to 2, times the standard deviation here of the errors. That's what we're going to use right here, what I gave you. So that will be times, let's just say that's approximately 1.06. All right, just so we can do this in our heads. So that's 1.06. All right, and now there's, so we can do that, and so we say, and please put the, like in your homework, even if, it's, even if I didn't say, always put the low, lower end point first. Everybody does that. Some people have been switching and getting it marked wrong. Just assume it's always the lower one first. So put 5.2 minus um, 2.12, and we get 3.08. And then we're going to say 5.2 plus 2.12. So we'll get 7.32. That's all right. And then step two is super easy. Step two, we want a confidence interval, not for square root. And we're symmetrical around uh, our estimate here. 5.2 is the arithmetic mean of this. And we're going to, again, get a symmetrical confidence interval here. So it's going to be 95% confidence interval for the drinks is going to be what? We're just going to square those two. So that's 3.08 squared to 7.32 squared. And that is equal to about 9.5 rounded to 53.5. And again, 27 is not in the middle of that. It's not going to be the um, geometric mean, but it's going to be closer. It's closer, isn't 27 is, is closer to 9.5 than it is to 53.6. So note, the confidence interval is asymmetrical for drinks, but for square, is symmetrical for square root of drinks, but asymmetrical for drinks. Um, so it's not symmetrical around 27. So that's pretty much the idea. 